consultants we've been working with. Uh, we appreciate all the work on the process. And let's say good evening, Mayor, uh, members of the council, and to the city manager, members of your team. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with uh, uh, Joel and David, and I think you're fortunate to have him here as part of your project, uh, development and hopefully project. Uh, again, Reggie Scales, I'm the CPL, we're architects and engineers uh, and park planners, which is why we're a part uh, of this process. So, what I'm going to do is talk to you about this in general, at a macro level. Higher with about 20,000 feet, and we'll drill down just a bit. Talk a little bit, and, and, as Joel said, about the process and what we did. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time uh, talking to people uh, because uh, ultimately you want to do that to get an idea of what we call beginning with the end in mind. Uh, we had three groups, uh, three focus group meetings uh, that was social or uh, community. Uh, we met with an economic team, and then again, as, as Joel has uh, shown you. We also met with a, an environmental group. All right, and so those three issue areas really kind of make up some of the drivers for this part, some of the important parts of, uh, again, developing a, a ultimately a plan that uh, is going to be supported by everyone. So as we look at this, uh, you can see the slide here, adjacent parks and parcels, pretty important. Uh, there are six parks, six city parks over 300 acres that are interconnected with uh, with Battle Park. Uh, and I do want to mention it because it's pretty important. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Park, uh, Smith Tower Park, Rocky Mountain Sports Complex, Sunset Park, Best Friends Dog Park, and City Lake. And so they are all connected here. And, and as we go through this discussion, you'll see kind of how important it is. Um, US, 60, uh, US 64 and the 87 quarter, also critically important. And as I talk to you, I'll talk a little bit about what we found through the focus group meetings. One of the comments, key comments from the economic group was, hey, uh, they mentioned the Whirligate Park in Wilson, North Carolina. I said, why can't this be a regional park or somewhere regionally that folks can coalesce or come to? And that has a lot of different... Uh, after when it was 
established. Um, when it was established in 76, that gazebo and part of that was a big part of the halls. And then the, uh, another area we looked at, native species and historic demonstration areas. Feedback we got from focus groups. Uh, people love the park, but they also want to see it opened up such that when you're in the park, you can get some vistas or those view sheds of the river. And so we balance that with the environmental group. Well, how do you do that? And at the same time, maintain the flora and fauna that's there now without destroying it. And again, the concepts that we come up with, that stewardship plan, uh, certainly is in the works, but we, we come up with some pretty decent comments or, or concepts, I think, that will allow folks uh, their interest in ideas uh, to be realized. Final issue here is the economic and business case and future development. So we've got two bullets there. I'm actually going to start with that second bullet, the economic case for Rocky Mountain. Uh, in my travels and career, uh, I spent about 12 years in the public sector. And one of the things I always looked at is return on investment. If you're placing dollars here, what are you getting out of it in return? What's the best interest of the taxpayer's money? And in recreation, outdoor recreation, you can look at the studies nationwide. Uh, people spend more money on outdoor recreation than they do on fuel and pharmaceuticals, believe it or not. It is a cash cow for local economies, but it's also important to your economic development, business development, and recruitment. There are a number of things that companies look at when they're looking to locate or relocate. And education, everybody always knows that, the recreation, recreation interests, recreation plans are a big part of that as well. So it's a integral part of the economic development plan. And then the long-term vision for a battle park, uh, as we went through the process, we didn't start at the uh, uh, at the end, but we started uh, many years ago. Uh, back in the early decade, last decade, there was a focus group meeting, and that group spent some time talking about what are your interests for recreation. Two big things came up. One is definitely education, but the other is active recreation. There's a 2015 master plan that's put together. So the battle park plan stems from that master plan, all the aims and the interests and the ideals that folks uh, were looking at in 2015. We actually tested those with the focus groups, and what we came out with is fairly direct and fairly focused. So I'm actually going to stop right there and see if you have any questions or ask uh, Joel to come back. So. Well, it, it's never really about size, but it, it's about what you offer. And, and again, the reason we spend so much time with focus groups, it is what do you offer? Does it match what your citizens are looking for? Does it match your community and what you need? And so what I will say about Rocky Mount, uh, and we've been working here on this project for about six months now, I'm amazed at uh, the opportunities, the, the dynamic interests, and all the things that are going on here locally. So, um, but I, I guess to, to go to your point, you are where you're where you're supposed to be from a recreation standpoint because it truly does reflect what the citizens want. But more important, you're you're getting that input in to continue that. Yes. And then once that's done, it's 
our staff responsible for helping to monitor that or facilitate that? Is there any kind of staffing that we envision to facilitate the public experience of that? Uh, we were we involved Rocky Mountain Mills throughout this process, uh, being in proximity to the um, to, to Battle Park, and we've had conversations. And uh, anything dealing with our property, we would be responsible for that signage, and that's part of the importance of the trailhead to make sure you understand. You know, these, these are spots that are public access that you can get to. We've also even talked about extending those trailheads to to MLK Park. You know, over Sunset Park. So the whole trail system has a similar message about you know these are points you can fish at, these are your picnic launches, these are places that you can get into across the system. Um, as far as a staffing concept for you know how to enforce that, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, that's part of the process we'll look at as we get into that environmental, educational, informational signage to make sure um, it's a passive park. So most of the time, you know, staffs not out there. But you want to make sure that you're still controlling your crowds and giving out as much information as possible. And uh, we, we, we've given a good portion of this budget to try to make sure our educational and informational signage is um, as much as we need. And I have um, just two more questions when I'm done. Uh, so then for security issues that were mentioned earlier, um, are we working, I'm sure we are in tandem with the um, police department and about what's appropriate and um, is there any kind of patrol that occurs there, or is that just everybody be careful? Well, we've been, uh, the police department, one of the first folks we brought in on this, along with the Sheriff Park Fire Department, just to make sure that we're, uh, um, you know, crossing our T's and dotting our I's. We got feedback from them over the past several years about, you know, issues at the park. And that park is no different than any other natural park in any other city. Um, you know, areas like that, you know, you want to make sure you control your line of sight. Make sure you can see through uh, wooded areas so you try to eliminate spots where people can hide. And, uh, we work with that on the police department. There's been some lower level discussions about how we patrol it going forward. Uh, like I said, those, those discussions are still in the beginning stages, uh, whether or not it's a staff person or whether or not it's you know um, a blue light system or something like that. Uh, but we have some of that funding in there to, to address those issues. So we're talking about it, planning, and trying to be appropriate in every sense without being intruding on other people's rights. Absolutely. That was one of the highest priorities that we got out of all our meetings was to make sure that we presented a safe okay. safe part. And my last question is concerning the economic benefit. Um, and many years ago, right, I believe, right when the manager first came, um, we had conversation about an opportunity for um, for people to have significant interactions that might translate into commerce, you know, whether it be canoeing or, I don't know, whatever you do on the water, you know, uh, but wanting to have those opportunities upstream and downstream. Um, in your planning, are you looking for sites along the stretch of the river on both sides of the county line to where there can be opportunity for participation in this economic benefit directly as well as indirectly in the market. Yes, sir. I think Park Plan addresses uh, part of that 55, 55 mile um, paddle trail we have um, allows for access uh, and removal on both sides of the river. Uh, part of these grant funds we would see would be improved boats. Um, and actually, we're trying to. Um, you know, one of the things people like to do is they want to they want to be able to canoe, get out on this side of the dam, you know, carry their canoe over on the other side and, and get back in to do that. So that's part of the process we're looking at as well, is to make sure you've got access both upstream and downstream. Mayor Tim? Yes. I have a question following up on Councilmember Blankwell's most recent question. Sure. When you ask about opportunities for commercial development, are you speaking out at the edges of, at the perimeter of the park, and not on the park itself? We're not, I assume we're not talking about leasing out spots for them to for our business. Uh, no, that is not part of the plan. And actually, um, 
you know, we've received questions. All the asphalt that we would go put in that park, there's already asphalt there. It would just be replacement of the current um, trail system that we have. The natural surface. That's a separate question. What I was asking about was business activity, and I suppose I don't understand. No, I'm trying to be sure that you're not saying there would be spots within that park where a person, a vendor, for instance, could operate a business for profit. No, ma'am. Okay. And I did have a question with regard to the park, the um, materials. You said there would be natural materials that would be used in the trail. Is that material something that would be permeable? So that wood would soak into the material and not create a wash? If we were able to receive the funds for the natural surface trail, uh, basically what you do is you scrape the top a couple inches off um, and you get to the hard pack that's already there. You don't put anything on top of it. Uh, there are similar trails up in Medoc Mountain and some other parks. Uh, but basically you bring in a, a, a crew that knows what they're doing with there and you work with the um, slope and the elevation to make sure that runoff um, does not affect the dam, does not affect the landscape. And basically, if you do it right, you can't even really tell those trails are there until you get on top of them. And that would be our goal: is to make sure we maintain the, you know, environmental, you know, aspect of that park. Thank you. Um, going back to commerce, uh, so I am kind of curious to see, you know, how that would develop. So there's some of the opportunities. Um, you know, what comes to mind to me are outfitters, perhaps some sort of ecotourism where I'm doing education, I'm floating down the river, I'm looking at wild new growth of the Tar River clam or, or whatever it is that we're going through. You know, how do we encourage that? Because I think that does bring more people to the park to enjoy it. I think it also is a wonderful um, you know, draw into the area. It certainly complements some of the things that we are doing in terms of sports tourism. Uh, on those off times or off hours while you're waiting for your kid to have his next game. So has there been any outlay on that other than just recognizing that that, that, that could exist? I mean, they're, they all recognize that it could exist. There's been low-level conversations about typically that's a private um, company that's doing those types of tours or, or new launches. Um, from our grant perspective right now, we're trying to make sure that we have all of the the things needed in place to make that occur, right. uh, but there's not been any um, large level conversation about. Uh, well, so then, to follow up to uh, Councilman Miller's question is, um, you know, since we're not for, you know, anticipating that would actually be on park land, is there any kind of licensure or any kind of uh, license, you know, uh, franchise fee or any any kind of registration that you would anticipate for somebody to, to get involved in, and how are we going to publicize that? Because I think that's important. Uh, all right, so let me, let me answer that in a couple ways. Number one, in terms of the commerce, the Economic Committee, actually all of the focus groups spend some time talking about that very issue. How do we brand, how do we make uh, Battle, uh, Battle Park something that's special and unique? Do you want it to be kind of a regional destination park? If you know what Pullen Park is in, in, in Raleigh, that's a regional destination. Do you want it to be something like that? If you do want it to be in that area, what is the unique feature that draws? So you can use the example in Asheville. All right, they're known as the kind of the mountain biking place nationally, internationally, where you go and put in because they have the trailheads there. That's one area where you define, where you market, where you brand. So that, that's the conversation that would need to occur. And that's what the conversations that we had. So what, what do you want it to be? So what do you want it to be? You want to take advantage of the river. You want it to be education. You want to take advantage of the proximity to the highway. So again, these discussions need to occur, all right? So that's the one. But the most important thing, what I, I usually, what I, I like to focus on in these discussions goes to economic development, all right? It, it, it's about these investments come back to economic development. When you define that specific area, then you can start to leverage it in other areas. Now, a city of this size, Rocky Mountain, the smokestacks and chasing those, you may get some, but studies have shown very clearly that it is the small businesses, the incubators, the micro, those specific, you know, those smaller businesses, they thrive in areas like this, all right? And again, you go back, what do you need to attract and to create an environment which benefits those businesses? Recreation is a key, a key part of that. 
I think we want all of that. Um, right. That you just mentioned, and we look for you and our staff to bring something to us to help us to define what we really want to make it a regional um, a place to come. And we did mention at one point uh, about Goat Island, Panther Island, uh, and doing the zip line. I don't know if that's part of your uh, implementation. And the second thing, one of the peer or the outlook deck or whatever one of the proper name was taken down, is that going to be replaced? And then the third thing, uh, far as this, two more things, uh, the signage for uh, fishing, uh, the city uh, currently owns property across the river adjacent to the mill. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Okay, so we need to define what we own and what's private and what's public. Last thing I want to mention, uh, the protection of the graveyard. I think that's a very old um, um, the cemetery there that probably needs some more protection. Um, so there's some, some of the things that I want to mention, but I do want to hear more about the Panther Island and Goat Island. There used to be a bridge that would connect the Battle Park side to the from a perspective of, uh, there were a couple of key points there. I want to make sure I address some of this stuff. The outlook that was removed was removed due to some safety issues on um, the construction of that. Uh, there's nothing in there right now to replace that based on the grant funding um, and the plan will be put in place. Uh, the bridge, you know, we've, we've put a, you know, a visual aid of what something might look like, but now we didn't put figures to that um, yet because that's a, that's a long-term goal. Um, that is something that based on the floodplain, based on a lot of mitigation hazards that we have to go through numerous reviews through um, some, some various levels of authority to make sure we, we, we do that correctly. Uh, but uh, they've done some, some beginning legwork on that, CPLS for us. We, we can provide that information. Um, Panther Island, um, I, I, I prefer to get some more information to you at a separate time. I'm not really prepared to answer any questions on Panther Island other than the, um, you know, it came up as part of the property. Uh, but most of the grant funding that we have is dedicated towards uh, stuff on this side of Panther Island, per se. So that's a big deal. Um, we've had, and that's why I was a little mystified about the comment about, you know, private activity, because we had committed the whole presentations where it was all about private commerce, um, canoeing, zip lining, and other um, opportunities for commerce. And that's why I asked the question related to where will these opportunities be held? What will they look like? Who makes the decisions about what gets installed? And are we saying the only place that commerce can take place is at where the Rocky Mountain Hill location is? So um, I think that it would be um, important when we talk about the economic case for Rocky Mountain that we take a broad view, as the mayor outlined, as Mayor Pro Tem outlined, um, about how to incorporate that and still preserve the natural beauty you know, and the um, pristine nature of our park. I also do have a question about the history. I think someone asked about history. There's a lot of history that's taking place there. Are we engaging in any conversation with the Tuscaloosa Nation um, that had the census settlement at that site? That came up on several meetings, and that was a key aspect of people wanted to make sure that it was preserved out there. So is that a question? I mean, I'm asking you, um, is there any formal plan to have communication with the Tuscaloosa Nation? We'll bring in David. He's our grant writer. <laughs> okay. Expert. Good afternoon. Um, we, we will have informational signage throughout the park. Uh, not only the Tuscaloosa War, but the Tuscaloosa War predated by about 8,000 years by Paleo Indians before them. So we're going to have signage uh, throughout the park where that is. In 1712, the Tuscaloosa War taken up and moved upstate New York. 
So there are ties to the area. Uh, we've tried to do events with them at the Imperial Center. They, have, they no longer have ties to Rocky Mountain, unfortunately. So that, that's one thing we have done that we will continue. We'll make sure that the information is there, though. That is going to be part of the science. So are you aware that they have many events throughout the state of North Carolina? The Tuscarora? Yeah. Okay. If you could help us with that information, yeah. I would sure. appreciate that. Sure. The, the nation is very active <laughs> throughout the entire state. And yeah. perhaps the you know, after the Trail of Tears and that um, intentional relocation and devastation of the nation you know, occurred um, while others were seven here um, occurred. But there was still there's still significant uh, populations of Tuscarora uh, that are in this area and throughout the state. So I think it would be very important um, to include uh, their history and their living legacy um, at that location as well. And we're happy to support Thank you. Uh, question for you, Lee. Uh, a couple of months, well not a couple of months, maybe six months ago, a solution had come to me about a Indian burial ground that's near, uh, right behind the, the tiny homes. And we reached out to uh, one of the representatives of the meal, and then we reached out to uh, the Rocky Mountain Telegram to maybe do some um, stories on uh, how uh, that part was unearthed. And I think a retention pond was put back there. Do we have any knowledge? Uh, we couldn't get anyone to to really investigate it, but do we have any knowledge of any uh, form of Indian burial grounds? It was little rocks like arrows that were, and there's still a couple there because we walked across the sewer line or, or outfit that was connected to Columbia Street. So I don't know if you have any, or if we have any records, and if so, uh, I think we want to uh, preserve that if we could. We do not know of any specific Indian burial grounds on the property. There's been discussion that there may be some. We have already gotten in touch with the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office and worked with them to. We're going to have quite a few environmental and historical and cultural regulations we're going to work with on this. Um, as we begin uh, the actual renovation project, Reggie's team has already has an archaeologist on staff on call. So if we run into anything, it's not we have to go out and find an archaeologist that already have someone. They're based out of Tarboro. But we can stop, see where we are, see what we're doing. But the entire project will, the term Reggie has used before is sit lightly upon the land. So we're not looking to do too much unearthing, too much moving of dirt. But we do want to be very respectful of all the peoples that have been there before us. If you're interested, um, I can show you the location of the person that showed it to me. Are there any other? Dr. I, I'm excited about this because Tar River is a major asset, in my opinion, that Rocky Mountain has not taken advantage of over the years, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Um, and it's not all centered around Battle Park necessarily. It can go up and down the river, just like uh, Councilman Blackwell uh, indicated. And just because you might be a, such as the mayor um, alluded to, if you're, if you're, you know, I think by going to the mountains and getting on vans and canoes and then people picking me up down, I mean, that, that's another way of downstream to bring you back. That's another way. And then I was curious with the, um, excited about the um, natural, um, what did you call it, multi-use trail. How long is that, out of curiosity? And, and will that help with some of the, maybe, the 5Ks, 10Ks that people have, which is also a big um, boost to the economics of, of the community? Uh, we've worked with the company before. It's been able to lay out a 5K course that stays in with those confines. So we've been able to handle races, um, uh, 3.1 miles. Um, that we, um, Tackle Tar was totally on board with it. They were excited about it, as well as some other folks we've talked to about the potential to but, but also I think it, we, we hit on commerce, but I think it's important that, that we, we focus on a company to come through because not everybody has a canoe or access to a canoe. And so people are going to need to rent these. And so I think it's important. Um, I just think of my son and his friends. They would love to go out the Tar River. They just don't have access to it. So uh, I think it's important. I understand, you know, we've got to be careful about 
being equal to everyone. We can't pick and choose, but we I think we need some sort of commerce because people do need to rent paddle boats or floats or whatever canoes because we, we need the kids to go out there and families to go out there. That's important. That's why I asked about the staffing you know, plans because I'm assuming that we would want to make some money too <laughs> since we are so looking at the uh, yeah, uh, you know, right? Since we're upkeep, we have to participate in the upkeep. Well, we're leading the upkeep, aren't we? So, um, I thought we did have kind of canoes. Well, it seems like we've done a Boy Scout troop somewhere along the way. Maybe it's been years ago, I don't know. I went on a Boy Scout, but I went out with it. Can I go to Ten years ago. <laughs> Could you speak in reference to where are the points that you can get on the canoe? I mean, it used to be uh, pay for? <coughs> charter, <coughs> charter drive. Used to be. Uh, Rocky Mountain should be extremely proud. We are the uh, steward of the largest paddle trail of any municipality in the state of North Carolina. We manage from Highway 58 near Spring Hope all the way down to uh, Dunbar. Um, going to Tarver, we have 10 access sites, uh, Ladies Ferry Canoe Launch on Halifax Road, uh, Nashville Road at the Old Arch Center, we're West Sunset, Battle Park, where we got on the day at uh, Charter Oaks Park, because I like Charter Oaks Park, and then at, at Wastewater Creek, we plant two on Stony Creek. So we have all of those. So we do have many accesses. We're extremely blessed. Not only do we have a large river in our city, we also have Stony Creek in our city. So uh, they're just natural resources that are there, and people enjoy it. That's why Rocky Mountain is here also. This, this is the cradle of, of our community. Well, I'll be taking advantage, because um, I don't hear too much about the canoe uh, program now, or activities. Uh, we are not offering new programs at the, at the moment. Uh, we did so, David did that for years. Uh, and then his services, we, we pulled him over to the uh, Imperial Center to run that for a while. Now we've got more grants. Uh, like I said, the, um, that's something we, that this has come up in discussion and we can continue to talk about uh, for the future of the park, uh, about how uh, we can address that moving forward. I know that Jamila Hawkins did a lot of work over in the Tarver area, one of the uh, sites. And are we doing any? kind of work historically with the twin county process. Uh, I mean we we've worked um, with the what's the trail river? <coughs> Sound Rivers. Sound Rivers, which basically takes the river um, from the part it crosses in North Carolina and use it out. Um, so we worked Tarboro and Greenville, uh, try to make sure our signage is up to date and stays, you know, our mileage markers stay on point. Um, that's the extent of the, the cooperation that we work with right now. But uh, we have those lines of communication open to be able to reach out and talk. Okay, thank you. So, uh, City Manager, I guess our direction today is just to hear the presentation. Or well, you want us to, um, three things I heard, the economic opportunities, both private and public, um, preserving the Native American history and burial grounds, and preserving the natural areas. I leave out something, council member. And that economic opportunity is with canoeing and zip lining and private areas and go island and Panther, Panther right. Island. Yes, sir. So our intent today was to uh, present information. Uh, the things that you have pointed out, we will include in the plan that we bring back to you for your consideration and adoption. Uh, at the next meeting. Mr. I'm Joel left before we had a chance to get real, but I want to say thank you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I want to say thank you. Very important um, to all of us as a city, our history, but more importantly, I think our future. So thank you for your good work. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we're going to have our Main Street Economic Development Incentive and sewer services, right? Uh, actually, oh, that's not going to be Elton. Elton Daniels, assistant city manager. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor, City Manager, Members of Council. Uh, thank you for having me here today. 
Uh, what you have before you is a request from staff to amend policy number 10.29, uh, which is basically, in short, uh, economic incentive to provide uh, assistance to people development on, along Main Street. If you have any questions, I'll be more than willing to uh, try to address those at this time. It's uh, specifically uh, to address uh, water and sewer tax. Councilman Dock. What is the justification for that? Oh, to try to go ahead. To try to increase uh, development activity uh, along Main Street, specifically directed toward mixed use development. What is the justification for that? Well, I've been a downtown development proponent for many years. I just the concern has always been expressed that we're not. Uh, adversely affect businesses that work in other areas by providing special treatment for downtown. But I just wanted, we need to have our case thoroughly brought to thought through. Well, I, okay. may, may I jump in on that? I think that the, um, the condition that the downtown is, certainly it has been approved, improving over the years. And if we want to get down to the nuts and bolts about what we have and what we don't have, and if we need more incentive, then we can do that then. And uh, we can just move forward with this. And, and Mr. Uh, Mayor Pro Tim, I'd also like to say, uh, many times something has occurred, it's been economically beneficial for all of us. You know, um, the streetscape brought in another level of infusion of money, but also interest and attention. Um, I think about the park that our councilman um, visited you know, that was park downtown, which was private investment. Um, the vision was seen about what needs to happen. Um, every time we made investment, we got money back. 
So I think it's a good question you're asking, Councilman Dondrich, about uh, what's the term. So let's document that. You know, when the event center came with the advent of COVID, we did in the middle of a, of a big season, I believe. Um, but we've seen sales revenue, sales tax revenues increase. We've seen investment increase downtown. We've seen people working downtown that never worked before. And um, if you're on any corridor on Saturdays, you know, folks are down. We got an art center down. I mean, it's exciting about what's happening. But I'm saying, I agree with that. I think we're all saying the same thing. Let's do more. So, um, you know, we only have one downtown. We all going to say we got one downtown. And what every economic developer says across the world is that downtown is your living room. And it doesn't matter what the edges look like or the periphery looks like. If the poor is not presentable, then that's people's takeaway of your city. And, and I'm proud that we have had a developing, um, a beautiful downtown buildings built. They are not buildings all over Rocky Mountain that were built in 1891, 1911. This is the only place in our city with a concentration of history like that, where you can physically see the hands of generations all the time and building a future for the present. So I, I'm fully supportive of this, and, and I, don't, I guess we can't vote on it here, because everybody vote on the kind of session. That's true. So I, I just again want to say kudos to you. Thanks for discovering new ways. Today, I think you might be a lot investment and strategic to get the vision of our city that we live in. Yeah, so to your point, uh, Councilman Blackwell, uh, you were talking about the economic impact. Uh, when you're dealing with things like this for user fees, once we get this in place and Council decides to do that, you're going to have an immediate return on your investment because we'll have new users downtown. I agree with the mayor. I think we need a master plan. I, I, I feel as if we're, again, and I'm repeating myself, piecemealing things in here. I think we need a master plan of of the incentives that we're going to give, give, and if, if other communities are doing stuff, doing more than we are, doing less than we are, I think we need to know that. And then come in here and present it at one time, either, either go in game busters, what we're doing now is we're piecemealing everything in, because we keep on coming to the table and saying, well, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, and at some point, we don't know the impact it's going to have. On, on this community, you know, well, actually on our budget. I mean, I'd ask the question of, of, and I hope you can come back and say this is going to be the worst case scenario, so to speak, if everybody takes advantage of it, it's going to cost the city X. Because it's going to be an expense to the taxpayers. And someone's going to have to pay for it, and it's going to be the taxpayers. And it's a return to the taxpayers. I didn't say it wasn't a return, I said it's going to cost. And just like, and just like when a business comes here, whether it's Cal's Gateway Partnership or the state brings in a company to come here, it's economic development. I think everyone gets that, but I think we need to know what the cost is. Of course, I'd like, I like to make a motion Could I, to put this on the agenda. Sure. Second motion. Okay. Um, the motion is made by Councilman Blackwell, second by Councilman Joyner. Uh, all in favor, let it be known by the votes. Aye. Discussion, aye. please. Discussion. We just had a discussion. No. Do you have a. No. Nobody called the question. I'm just asking to make one more request with regard to moving to a vote. Okay, you can do that without. Excuse me. Councilman Miller. When the information is Council Miller Miller. Please show it. Council Miller. Council. Council Member Miller. I will recognize you to speak. Okay. Let's get some order here. Would you like to speak on the motion on the floor? I'm speaking to the discussion with the floor to to request that this information be brought forward. My request is simply that when you presenting this information in terms of the money invested that that be presented in terms of a percentage of our tax base or tax revenue, not just an amorphous number out there. When you're talking about what other cities have done, give it to us as a percentage of their capital investment. 
Thank you. Thank you. Point taken. All in favor, let it be known by the vote side. Aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Okay. You can show a hand. That's up to the Well, we'll just put it on the agenda. We got to vote for it anyway. So. Yeah, we put it on the agenda. The motion was to place the Main Street Economic Development Incentive Water and Sewer Services proposal on the agenda at the next council meeting. Correct. In the past, right? Correct. Thank you. I, I do want to make a comment uh, about piecemealing, but I, I'll make that at the next meeting because it's not being piecemealed. Thank, Thank you. you. Is it on that? No. I would like to say that we didn't have our retreat, and I would like to ask the city manager staff at some appropriate time that we still need as a city council staff to come together and some of those agenda items that we wanted to go over, we still need to come together and do that at some appropriate time. I hope we can do that. And just for the council, um, uh, FYI, uh, I'll be working with the city manager to bring those topics of interest. So that was on the um, council retreat uh, to bring forth to us uh, for further discussion. At this time, we're going to have the draft of the Heritage Pedestrian Trail Conceptual Plan, Brian Carr. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. You here? Okay. Um, so, just um, this is a draft of the uh, Heritage Trail Pedestrian Plan. We need a little bit of guidance on this. Um, just real quickly, we want to go through this from the council members who weren't here for the wayfinding plan. Quick review of the original wayfinding plan. Uh, so the original wayfinding plan composed five districts, um, the downtown district, Mills district, Gateway district, um, proposed district on the south, and then another district on the north to the uh, later, and then the future district on the 64 and Violet Boulevard. Um, as part of that wayfinding plan, the proposal was to connect downtown with the district to the north to be named. Um, through a heritage trail connection, so kind of celebrating the vast amount of history that was occurred in this area. Um, so the, the district plan itself hasn't been named, but this working group that we're proposing to work with would help uh, develop that for that proposed district to the north. Uh, and that, me, that district to the north includes those from Douglas Block, MLK Park, Stiff Tower Park. We'll get into that detail more later. Uh, just a quick review of the signage um, that you all have seen go up in the downtown. Um, the part that we haven't put up yet is the pedestrian kiosks. Uh, and this plan is to try to get ball rolling on getting some of those kiosks going. Um, five of those were included in the original um, downtown master plan, but haven't installed yet. Again, parking and the other signs you've seen up around town. Um, so if there are any questions on the master plan, I'll, I'll kind of dive into this um, draft. Um, Pedestrian uh, heritage trail plan. I just have a question on the construction yeah. of the sign. Why is it not painted black or why is it just raw steel? Um, that is a very standard type, of, so you don't have to maintain it. It will rust naturally to the surface rust and then it doesn't ever have to be painted or maintained again. It's a very common technique. So it doesn't, it doesn't degrade the no, it forms the surface rest, protects the rest of the steel, and okay. it'll stay like that. And you've seen some power poles around downtown over Falls Road. You see them, the rest of it, they're good for you. Okay, all right. That was just a concern I've always had. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, so there are a series of uh, five signs downtown, um, and this, this plan kind of locates those with various different themes um, that we were proposing. And then, we have, so those five signs are this one at, uh, Atlantic, um, Gold Leaf and Albemarle, Gold Leaf and Main Street, Douglas Block, uh, one at Five Points, and one um, at uh, on Main Street. Uh, and you'll see um, various uh, suggestions for what that content would be. And what I would point out is that these signs right here, that sign content can be changed out over time. 
but we want to have an idea of that the things are right so that we put those signs in the right location. Um, and then if we want to in the future change them out, we can change the content without changing the sign. Um, the next part of the phase, which is we want to get the citizens advisory group together to flesh out the details, but is the what we call the Heritage Trail. And it starts probably up in this area um, with an area that we're calling uh, Professional Road. Um, and then you see some landmark buildings from downtown in this area. Um, going down uh, Albemarle Avenue, which we found through our downtown Albemarle discussion downtown, that that was a very um, prominent location for African American community. Um, and we have the Mitchell House in the middle of that block, and we have Buck Leonard's um, house at this intersection. Uh, you have the marker, two historical markers for this uh, sanitation strike and the MLK speaker. And then we have a series of what we call interpretive signs, and that's these bigger signs that you kind of see in parks, the long light signs um, that we're proposing down through here. And then on with another one in MLK. Again, this is just a graph plan to give the folks, the working committee, you know, something to work with on in developing content. Um, the one thing that we do will propose that we get your guidance on is moving forward with the installation of the um, Alexander Evans interpretive sign. And you have a mock up graph, there's no content, but you can feel what it looks like. Um, that Alexander Evans sign and the sidewalk uh, along Spruce Street from Atlantic Avenue tying into the existing sidewalk in Stiff Talbot Park. Um, just to tie in with the dedications of the Alexander Evans um, complex. Uh, Signs that will be dedicated to the future. Um, and that's kind of really the gist of the plan. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you're looking for a little bit of guidance on if we're on the right path with this, um, and, um, and give us authorization to proceed with those two construction of those two elements that you set aside. Any questions of Council members? I know Council Member Black, you get some concerns. Are they addressed at this? Yes, they're addressed. This looks good. Thank you. Actually, um, I think it's great, but I, I, at some point, and, and maybe I'm eager to, to it, do we have it on our website, a very interactive website, or do we have, or, or is there plans to maybe put some sort of, uh, with everything that we're doing within the city, some sort of app or something that, when we have visitors coming to the event center, we have people coming to the ball fields, you know, uh, most people are in vehicles, and it's going to be hard to see you know, a lot of the history and so forth that goes along with it. So I would encourage at some point, not now, uh, really make a very interactive website and or app that goes along with that. And I think we would, it would be utilized more than just the signs alone that you have to actually have to do that. Uh, I, that sounds like a great idea. We do develop that. I'm sure there's technology in place for scanning the bar scan and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, actually, we um, we are investigating that now. Um, kiosks, uh, in particular, that we saw at NLC uh, made in the in City Hall. We'll just see, but we are investigating that, and not only for the City Hall, but also for the event center, the business services center, and some of those areas that are frequented a lot by uh, the public. Thank you. At this time, we have a review of the third quarter fiscal year 2020 report. Uh, revenue expenditures, uh, Kenneth Honor, come. Let's be reminded of the time, 621, council meeting at 7. And then we have a closed session as well. If we don't get to that, we come back. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. I'll do my best to make this quick and informative. Uh, we are now completed with the third quarter. Obviously, under normal circumstances, the report that I would provide would be a little different. But obviously, the COVID-19 event has had a significant impact on us, not only in terms of operations, not only in terms of uh, lives, but also, of course, economic issues. And those uh, do play a role. They don't show their head with as much in the third quarter because the third quarter ends in March. And some of the revenues that would be impacted in the month of March, which is when we started seeing the slowdown and the shutdown of the economy, uh, primarily due to the area taxes, sales tax, we will not see until the fourth quarter due to the delays in collection. 
But uh, overall, I just want to show you a review of where we are with respect to revenues and expenditures. Talk a little bit about how we're going to be doing our best to evaluate our performance ongoing to make sure that the even if even when we present you our balanced budget plan for fiscal year 2021, to also make sure that we're operating in a balanced fashion with respect to revenues and expenditures. Talk a little bit about the end of year projections for the general fund. And again, these are projections based on what we think is going to happen in the final quarter of this year. And these are projections that we've already taken action on with respect to uh, budget reductions in the current year, as well as also provide an employment update. And again, this information in the employment update will also be reflective of where we were in February of this year, which was prior to uh, the employment impacts that were occurred due to COVID. With respect to the third quarter, as you can see, uh, and you had a chance to look at your report and it shows in the presentation, we can tell, we continued through the through the first nine months of this year to see growth in both ad valorem and sales tax revenues. And uh, we were definitely doing very well in those areas. Obviously, that certain, those circumstances have changed with respect to sales tax. We're fortunate with respect to ad valorem, of course, being collected on real property in the uh, second quarter of the year, that's pretty much taken care of. So that's not as big of a concern in terms of looking at the uh, latter part of this current fiscal year. Uh, we also saw that our revenue growth did outpace our spending growth to the third quarter. So we are seeing greater collections and we are doing our best to maintain limited growth of expenditures. Obviously we do have some growth in certain areas. Um, what we did have to do, and you'll see it in the upcoming, in the upcoming slide, is we did have to make some significant budget reductions, and we took, took those in effect at the beginning of the fourth quarter. So in early April, those were implemented, and they constituted a little, almost $3 million of reductions that we made to accounts in the general fund, along with reductions in other funds, to make sure that we finish this year in a balanced fashion. Um, and we, because of that, do not anticipate using any of the $1.5 million of adopted appropriated fund balance. So that will return to fund balance at the end of this year. With respect to the utilities, Prior to the start of the third quarter, electric sales were a little ahead of budgeted projections. They're now a little bit behind, but not significantly. Gas is also behind because we, of course, had a moderate winter, which does affect gas. However, the good news is, is that the wholesale cost for both of those utilities have also been down, particularly with respect to natural gas, so it has not affected our margins significantly. Uh, the expenditure activity is also reduced. Uh, that's, that's the prime factor in reducing our expenditure activity in both funds. On the water and sewer side, water sales have been close to our budgeted projections and have remained so through the course of the year. Uh, we continue to see a down, we continue to have a down year in sewer sales due and mainly to a dry wet, due to dry weather, which affects our uh, some of our resale customers, other jurisdictions, uh, the funds that we receive because of their inflowing infiltration. That's not happening. Uh, and also some key customer usage reductions that we have noticed. Uh, however, uh, the operating expenditures have been in line with these reductions. We do, however, have some significant expenditures that you'll note on the capital side of both water and sewer, and those were planned, and there was a plan used an appropriation of available reserves to cover those expenses in both water and sewer. I want to talk a little bit now with respect to operating ratios, and this is a very simple equation. Total, it's uh, basically looking at total revenues and dividing it by total expenditures. And really, if you're at one, you're in balance, and obviously one is where you want to finish out. And the reason why we look, the reason why we're kind of looking at it a little in a timeline fashion, is because the flow, there is a there's a difference in the timing with respect to revenues and expenditures. I know this happens in business as well as it happens in government. And the main driver of that timeline difference is the property tax. Property tax is over twenty over twenty two twenty or almost twenty five million dollars total, and a lot of that's collected in the second quarter. So the first quarter you don't see our main property tax collections. You see most of your property taxes in the second quarter and it trails and it lobs off not much in the third and hardly any in the fourth. And so as a result, your expenditures obviously are more consistent throughout the course of the year, particularly salaries and benefits. As we're moving forward, we need to do our best to make sure that as we perform in our budget, that the actual performance during the fiscal year, that we're hitting these operating ratio targets so that we make sure that we're going to finish out the year in as close to a balanced fashion as possible. Because what we don't want to do is finish is come into the end of the fiscal year looking like we're going to have to make major reductions and not be able to do it, obviously, because you don't have the account capacity to make those budget reductions. We were very fortunate because, as you can see here, at the end of this current third quarter, we finished in line with respect to our uh, margin. Our target was 1.11. We actually had a target. We actually completed a little over 1.12. That put us in a position to be able, that we knew that we had the the flexibility within the budget, even in the final quarter of the year, to be able to make the necessary budget reductions. 
and uh, that's very important. That's a very important position to be in. Obviously, we want to finish the fourth quarter this year and next year and every year with a ratio of one, which indicates that we're not using fund balance, that we are that we are managing our budget in an effective manner. We do use about we do use fund balance to budget to balance the budget from a planning perspective, and if an absolute catastrophe does occur, to be able to have that flexibility. But our goal throughout the course of the year is to find savings and other and potentially growth and revenue to do that. That becomes a little bit more difficult as we move toward in this COVID situation. Looking at our projections, and I apologize because the uh, presentation, um, the, the way it's little shown up on the screen, it, it hides a little bit, but y'all had a chance to see um, the information. Uh, when we started out the fiscal year, when we started, when we were coming into the end of the third quarter, we were potentially looking at having a situation where our revenues were going to exceed projections by over $900,000. So we were going to have a very good fiscal year, and then COVID happened. And as a result of COVID, particularly with impact on sales tax, impact on some other forms of taxes, the impact it's going to have on the interest return on investments, a similar reduction in interest rates to what we saw during the 2008-2009 recession, and of course the long-term continuance of that is another concern, as well as the impact that it has on our programs and services, including the operations of park facilities and other programs that we have, we're looking at a deficit, I mean, a shortfall in revenues of about $2.6 million. And uh, we, have, we have reduced our budget a little bit more than that to potentially also to be prepared for the fact that our revenues could decrease even more. This does not take into consideration any stabilization coming from any source. We simply cannot plan for that at this point. We know that there's discussions of that, but we cannot plan for that at this point. Take this opportunity now to talk about with a little bit of respect to employment. This information again is in February, and what February will do now is kind of serve as a benchmark for the pre-COVID points. There was obviously no impact of COVID in February in February's numbers. Uh, we saw some, we'll see some impact in March, and obviously significant impact in April. But as you can see here, employment had picked up in the month of February compared to the month of January based on the yellow bars and how they compare to the for the yellow bar to the right in both chart tables how it compares to the immediate one to the left. But they were slightly down for the year as compared to look year to year. One year change in employment, as you can see here, looking at other metropolitan areas, we were slightly down uh, at that point. These numbers had been revised uh, by the state uh, starting in January and had been revised backwards a little bit. Looking at the total in, that our employment base, looking at the standpoint of the sector, and we showed this information last quarter, and again, it just bears repeating. Um, about uh, 43,500 jobs are service sector jobs in Rocky Mountain, and about uh, 12,600 are goods producing jobs. And that's for the metropolitan area. This information is not available on a city basis. So we are obviously going to be watching very carefully the impact that this whole situation has not only on the overall jobs front, but on the jobs front with respect to each sector. Some sectors, as you know, are more susceptible to potential decline than others, depending on the impact that we're, that we're expecting. We also shared this information about average wages by sector. For the most part, there was not significant change across most sectors comparing the uh, third quarter of 2019 compared to the second quarter, which is what we provided before. Overall, the workforce average of $19.24 19 an hour actually went up a few cents. So to conclude, um, I believe that with the actions that have been taken by our staff, uh, the, the actions and the leadership of the city manager that have been taken by our staff, that we are prepared to, to uh, handle the impact of COVID-19 and its impact on our budget from the standpoint of revenues, that we're prepared to handle that in the current fiscal year. Uh, next fiscal year will, have to, will be a very difficult year, and as we continue to work with the budget, which you all will receive in a couple of weeks, uh, we are starting with a conservative outlook. We're only considering those revenues that we're absolutely certain that we're going to receive and not anticipating, not building out the anticipation of any additional revenues. However, we do anticipate it to be a fluid situation. We don't know what the recovery is going to look like. Uh, you probably, you know, first obviously it's to give me information in the news about different models and different concepts. What we want to do is be prepared to adjust as the recovery adjusts. And so there will likely be a need, hopefully, this is our hope, we hope that this happens, that the recovery improves in a, in a solid fashion, improves better, and allows us then to anticipate bringing to you amendments to increase appropriations as the situation improves. 
particularly with respect to profit, I mean, with respect to sales tax. All right, thank you. City Manager, do you have anything to add? No, sir, I think that concludes the report. Okay. Any comments from council members at this time? If not, thank you. At this time, we're going to uh, we have a closed session for economic development. Census form. 
The census will determine funding for housing, programs, schools, hospitals, economic development, and much more in our community. If you have questions, you can contact one of the city census outreach members at 252-972-1181 or visit 2020census.gov. While the governor has lifted some restrictions during this pandemic, I would like to remind you to do as his executive order states. If you can, stay home. Please know that the city of Rocky Mountain that officials and staff are working to ensure you continue to receive excellent municipal services. As some businesses begin to reopen, the city's Water Resources Department is encouraging building owners and managers to follow the advice of the American Water Works Association and encourages commercial customers to flush their building's water system before reopening to the public. The shutting down of many commercial, commercial buildings across the city due to the coronavirus pandemic may have resulted in little or no water running through building pipes for an extended period. This may cause discolored water or lower chloramine uh, rigid, residual disinfectant, which could cause harmful microorganisms to proliferate. The stagnant water should therefore be flushed out as fresh water is drawn into the system. Per the City Council's direction, the moratorium on all utility disconnections will continue until further notice and late fees will not be assessed during this time. If you are in need of help with your bill, please contact the Business Service Center. Also, all commission and board meetings will continue to be canceled as well as neighborhood meetings, Citizen Academy, and the Rocky Mount Area Youth Council meetings. Stay informed, please, of all of the lasting information regarding our city. I encourage you to visit our website at rockymountnc.gov or contact us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Manager. Any questions for the manager? Okay. Let's move on to item six, which are presentations and recognitions. Um, so I have a proclamation to read, and then I'll walk down we'll do the presentation. Um, proclamation of the City of Rocky Mount, whereas the President and Congress of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day, and the week in which May 15th falls as National Police Week, and whereas the members of the Rocky Mount Police Department play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of residents and visitors in the city of Rocky Mount. And these officers, past and present, have, by their faith and loyal devotion to their responsibilities, rendered dedicated service to our community. And whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the problems and duties and responsibilities of law enforcement agencies, it is equally important that members of those agencies recognize their duty to serve the people by preserving life and property, by protecting citizens from violence or disorder, and by safeguarding the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression or intimidation. The men and women of the Rocky Mountain Police Department enjoy, an, a, enjoy a long and distinguished record of the service to the city of Rocky Mountain, have unceasingly provided vital public service, and have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for preserving the rights and security of all citizens. And whereas we must not forget those who have fallen in the line of duty, police officers know that they may face danger every day, and that, unfortunately, some have paid for protection of others with their lives. Their sacrifice along with those who have suffered severe injuries must not Police officer Alan Christopher Silver, who lost his life in the line of duty on May 2, 2007, and senior police officer Christopher Driver, who lost his life in the line of duty on June 23, 2018. Now, therefore, I see Saunders Robertson, Jr., mayor of the city of Rocky Mountain, to hereby proclaim May 10th through May 16, 2020, as Police Week, and May 15, 2020, as Peace Officers Memorial Day in the city of Rocky Mountain. 
present this to Chief Robinson. Mr. Mayor, may I say something? Mr. Mayor, yes, please. Uh, Chief, before you leave, um, what I would just like to say is that um, I don't know if I were a city to city council member in some of the other cities in the country. If I'd be as proud of our force as I am of the Rocky Mountain Police Department. And especially in very tumultuous times, um, we've seen um, people who have been commissioned and signed up to serve and protect the public uh, become predators and um, enemies of the people that they were hired to serve. And what I appreciate is that we have a police force in Rocky Mountain that has a reputation for protecting and serving everyone and doing so with honor and skill. I've witnessed myself firsthand, Madam Manager, um, um, opportunities when people could have taken, when officers could have taken a liberty and um, done some damage to the public. I've seen some times when it could have been justified, but because of the training and the temperament uh, that your leadership has encouraged, I've seen good decisions made and good outcomes occur. I also want to thank um, Madam Manager Chief Robinson. I appeal to him in particular about um, two or three months ago. Some kids in my neighborhood came to my house um, with broken bicycles and wanted me to help them fix it. And I, everybody knows I'm not a handyman. <laughs> but I'm thankful they came to me. I called the chief and he and um, several officers uh, the very next day brought brand new bicycles for three kids in my neighborhood. And that wasn't done for me. And that's the kind of police force that we have in Rocky Mountain. That's not an unusual thing. That's just standard par for course. And that happens with good leadership, bad manager, and good training, and good ethics. And I want to thank you. Well deserved, sir. Thank you, Chief. Let's move on to item number seven, which are petitions from the public. I have a Lewis No, sir, we have your information. Uh, it shows us you live on South Washington Street. You have a four to make your petition. You have three minutes. Thank you, sir. I <laughs> Do the best you can, please, Mr. Turner.
consideration of the fiscal year 2020 project ordinance amendment increasing appropriations in the occupancy tax fund which covers transfer of the general fund appropriated fiscal year 2020 adopted annual uh, operating budget of 500,000 and then item that's it <laughs> I'm so used to so much more uh, with that said do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda so moved so moved by Councilman Blackwell, there second? Second. Second by Councilman Joyner. Is there a need for discussion on item A? Being none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, by like sign. Motion carries. Item 9, this consideration request to apply for 2020 Patrick Leahy Bulletproof Vest Partnership Grant, formerly known as Bulletproof Vest Grant. $19,488 will provide funding for replacement of 32 vests, is a 50% local match required, which is $9,744. The recommended action is to authorize staff to submit application on behalf of the city, the two to authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute any required documentation, certifications, and subsequent grant agreement on behalf of the city. Move for approval. Motion made by uh, Councilman Daltridge. Is there a second? Second, second by Councilman uh, Joyner. Is there a need for discussion on item 9? I guess my only discussion on these 32 that is not a complete um, police force. I'm sure they all have both pretty best, but I guess are they all up to par and up to standard? And if not, then we we'll certainly should see about doing something about that. No, they, they certainly are up to standard. Great. It's good to hear. 
Okay, uh, any other discussion? Being on, I'll call for a vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, by like sign. Motion carries. Uh, item 10 on our agenda tonight is a consideration request to apply for fire department assistance for firefighters grant COVID-19 supplemental at $63,535 for critical personal protective equipment supplies. A local match is required for $6,353.50. Recommended action is to authorize the staff to submit an application on behalf of the city and second, to authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute any required documentation, certifications, and subsequent grant agreement on behalf of the city. Uh, motion made by uh, Councilman Knight, second by uh, Councilman Daltridge. Uh, is there a need for discussion on item 10? Being none, uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed by like sign. Motion 10 carries. Item 11 on the agenda is consideration of the fiscal year 2020 installment financing contract with U.S. Van Corp Government Leasing and Financing Inc. for equipment for $1,479,000 with a fixed interest rate of 1.58% for a 36-month term and $1,508,000 fixed interest rate of 1.793% for a 59-month term at a total cost of $2,987,000. Um, we have a breakdown here. Is there um, perhaps uh, Mr. Hunter, you want to walk us through what these items are very briefly before we have of $2,987,000. Um, we have a breakdown here. Is there um, perhaps uh, Mr. Hunter, you want to walk us through what these items are very briefly before we have over the next five years, approximately $49.3 million. Most of that being in the utilities. There is some need in the general government, but primarily that is in the utilities. Approximately $35.6 million coming from the enterprise funds and approximately $20.95 million coming from the general fund. You'll also see there the recognition of our power bill allocation over the next five years. And we recognize that the power bill allocation can be subject to change due to the impact of COVID on the revenue sources related to the power bill. So that is something obviously that we'll have to evaluate. And it's a little bit of a challenge because that information is typically not provided until next fall. So we're, we're a little, we'll have to be a little careful in terms of where we anticipate the power bill to be. We also do allocate some fund balance and reserves set aside for these purposes, predominantly in surface transportation and in the utilities. You'll also see almost $9 million in state grants that is primarily allocated to transit and to surface transportation, as well as a little bit of uh, federal grant money. The $4 million in vehicle permit fees, that is allocated all to surface transportation and that's all used for resurfacing. Uh, that is, of course, a share that's 80% of the $25 fee that is paid by people for registering or registration. Uh, and, of course, you see the other resources that are listed there as well. Over the next five years, our largest area of expenditure is in, in general government, is in service transportation of approximately $27.7 million. And again, uh, that, that, that is where we spend a lot, a tremendous amount of money, and we account for all of the service transportation power bill allocations in the CIP. Approximately 13.8 for facilities, $7.3 million in fire, 6.9 in parks and recreation, and a little over, a little about $4.9 million in police, as well as, as you see, transit, IT and communications, public works, and also the ongoing uh, maintenance of the Douglas Block, which is also considered in our CIP. That's over a five-year period. With respect to the coming fiscal year, we're anticipating in the enterprise fund revenues of approximately $7.5 million coming from the enterprise funds, approximately $7 million in installment debt, most of that is in the utilities, and a lot of that's tied to the, uh, the two major electric projects that we have scheduled in fiscal year 21, approximately $2.9 million from the general fund, as well as $2.4 million use of fund balance, and that is for some very specific projects that I'll talk about in a little bit. Also, as you can see, the allocation of the Powell Bill 1.8, we recognize that that number may be adjusted to reflect a different number depending on the circumstances that occur. We should, hopefully we'll know more as we're going into the budget, as we present the budget to you. With respect to the expenditures in fiscal year 2021, we are hoping that the surface transportation, we're hoping to be able to budget approximately $4.656 million. 
uh, that includes resurfacing as well as other transportation system improvements. Um, we're looking at approximately $2.1 million in facilities, about a million dollars in transit, and that covers all the major transit grants, uh, including acquisition of vehicles for our rural system, as well as the maintenance of our, of our, inter, of our intra-city transit system. Uh, looking about 700,000 for IT and communications, $550,000 in parks and recreation, $420,000 in public works, and then as you can see, these numbers do reflect some actions that we have already taken with respect to the capital budget for fiscal year 2021 as we anticipate significant uh, stress uh, as we go into next fiscal year. One of, the, one of the actions that we were able to take across the board is to eliminate in fiscal year 2021 only the purchase of vehicles and heavy rolling stock. And that will be across all operations, including both general government and utility enterprises. We are confident that our fleet can handle this. We are confident that we will be able to do what we need to with respect to maintenance and care of these vehicles. Uh, we anticipate that, that we'll be able to manage this process for one year and then hopefully be in a better position in fiscal year 22 uh, to be able to bring those, uh, bring those expenditures back into the CIP. This is not an all-inclusive list of projects that are included in the CIP, but these are some significant projects that I felt like needed to be brought forward to you as we follow in this discussion. Uh, the largest single expense that we have for general government in our CIP is our resurfacing program. Uh, right now we're anticipating trying to be able to fund uh, on an annual basis approximately $1.9 million. And we will continue to work to find ways to do more, to do as best we can with respect to this allocation. The administrative complex, uh, continuing the improvements, we've obviously have been doing significant work on the first floor. And to continue the uh, planned work on the first floor and second floor of the building will cost approximately $1 million, $1,060,000. CMAX sidewalk improvements. This is a major project that we have benefited now for several years of receiving 80% uh, of this is funded through the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Grant Program. And this allows us to be able to extend our sidewalk network uh, and service greater parts of the community. And that is approximately 875000 We also have plans for the, uh, for the redevelopment of our former National Guard Armory on Romney Boulevard. Uh, the first phase of that would be approximately $525,000. We do also have in here, of course, the, uh, the desire for the televising and available broadcast of council meetings. The infrastructure needs for this project to start the first phase, which is for the council chamber, is $455,000. The neighborhood park renovations, we have been trying to work to do annual, uh, to, to work to try to do as part of implementing elements of the master plan for parks. Uh, the renovation of parks on an annual basis. The next one scheduled, I believe, is Meadowbrook Park. Meadowbrook Park, uh, and, we, and we have budget, appropriate we budget and plan approximately three hundred thousand dollars. We also have two hundred thousand dollars for an item that has been discussed uh, to the council, and that is the paving of dirt streets. And obviously, we'll uh, be working with that. Co Conference and fire station improvements. Uh, this hundred fifty thousand dollars is for planning and other activities related to major renovations that will be taken care of, that will be taken at Station 2 uh, that we are moving forward with uh, to try and modernize that facility. And then we also have $100,000 uh, set aside for the evidence of property management facility for design work. This is uh, a major project that we need to take action on uh, in terms of uh, locating our evidence and property management of the police department into a, into a modern facility. From a utility enterprise perspective, the two projects that you see are listed at top are in the electric plant, and they have to do with uh, pretty significant pieces of equipment. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant generators, those generators are, I think, I believe are original to the construction of the wastewater treatment plant and are now beyond useful life. Uh, the electric fund will be taking over ownership of those generators and will be installing them uh, as part of an agreement with uh, the wastewater uh, utility as a customer. Uh, the, you, these generators not only provide backup power, but also can serve as, as peak shading facilities for load management. And it approximately costs $2.3 million. The Old Mill Point of Delivery Station is on Old Mill Road. Road. This is our original point of delivery station in the electric system. We have two. Uh, there are two major two transformers at the site that, according to now, to Duke Energy Progress, we are now needing to replace. The first one of those is scheduled in 2021. I believe the second one is scheduled in 2024. And uh, the first uh, generator replacement is $2.25 million. The next item is the Springfield Road widening. This is an NCDOT project. However, it is the city's responsibility to pay for relocation of water and sewer lines that occur with an NCDOT road widening project. So 
our obligation combined for water and sewer is $1 million. Uh, I believe that that project is completed. Johnson Street Pump Station Rehab is another million dollars. This is a situation where this uh, pump station is uh, experiencing increased capacities, and in order to ensure the integrity of the stormwater, I'm sorry, the wastewater system, a, a uh, rehab and upgrading of the capacity of this facility is required. Transmission, I'm sorry, the wastewater uh, treatment plant road paving, $540,000. The uh, roads um, at the wastewater treatment plant have not been paid since the original construction of the facility, and um, they've been repaid. Not they're still with their original pavement. The pavement is in need of replacement, not just because of the age, but also because of the nature. Uh, the nature of the vehicles that are on that vehicle on that uh, road now is much more heavier duty than what was on there before, including several 18 wheelers for the, the Pecco sludge and other other items, and so that's a necessary uh, repaving project at $540,000. Transmission pole replacement. Uh, we have uh, done a lot to work on replacing our aged transmission poles in our electric system. These are critical items that need to be replaced on a, on a, on a pre regular schedule. We're trying to do our best to continue to move the average age of these poles down as well as go from wooden poles to steel poles. Um, downtown drainage improvements. This is the design, this is the completion of design work as well as uh, some other items to initiate a project in stormwater. Uh, that is a rather significant project. It's the largest product, project we've ever had in the stormwater operation. And as you can see over, when you look at the CIP over the next several years, it's a rather significant investment that we need to make in order to address the, uh, the underground and above ground drainage needs of the downtown area. We also have money set aside, and these are annual appropriations that are set aside for the extension of gas mains, uh, for new gas mains and existing systems, as well as for the expansion of our gas system into unserviced areas which helps us grow the utility operations. It is the one, it's one of those utilities that we can grow, unlike the electric operation. Next, uh, the final steps that we'll talk about here involve um, what will be next, and that's really to incorporate what we are proposing into the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021, which all will receive in a couple of weeks. Uh, obviously, as we move forward, we will continue to need to do our best to adjust for the available revenues and take into account all the, all the priorities of our annual budget. There may be a need to defer some projects uh, that have been listed in the CIP. We may have to defer. If we do that, we will explain why as we go forward, as well as we need to make sure that we can assure our debt capacity. It's especially important in the general fund as we continue to work to maintain our bond rating and also continue to be in a position for future, for future development. That's all I have with respect to the presentation. Seeing uh, anybody have any questions for Mr. Hunter? Uh, Mr. Bullock, Councilman Bullock?
Well, well there, is, there is one that I brought up recently that I think needs to be addressed at some point, but I'm not sure if this is the time to address it. Does everybody have questions? I guess we should just go down the list, go along. Um, well, I've got several questions. I don't know how you want to do this, man. Well, this is question. This is for informational purpose only, and then hopefully we come back and we can get it all to discuss. Uh, so, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a process that makes sense. So should we just verbalize our, challenge, our questions or those that we have and, and then expect that that can be then uh, responded to in writing? Or is that something we want to try to do right now and talk about it? And then we can talk about the committee goal. I'd like to see the manager, if I could speak, speak to uh, outline the process. Um, what I'm recollecting that is just for informational purpose only. If any council member have any comments or recommendation or rejection that we bring them to a full discussion in reference to the CIP. That's fair. The question was, how do you want to receive them, Madam Manager? <laughs> well, <laughs> so we can take um, the comments here, but it's uh, better to send us um, an email and write in what your issues are. Uh, typically what happens is, uh, as you recall in the budget schedule, there are several meetings that have been um, set up for budget discussions, mm -hmm. and uh, the capital budget certainly could be uh, a part of uh, the discussions for any particular day that you wish to have them, but it's always easier for myself and the staff to receive um, what your questions are uh, via the email. That okay. way we can keep track of and make right. sure we're providing Well, then, would that be the case? Why don't we just work from left since Councilman Bullock has expressed uh, he had a list and work our way around the table through those that are participating online, and uh, then we can get you our comments on email and not really looking for response, but at least. You can call it reading into the record. I feel like a reasonable approach to this. It does. I thought, I, I thought you said that if we have any concern to email you will call you. Yeah, well, email is, is much better because okay. that way we can keep up with it and make sure that we um, address uh, what the questions or concerns are. But I have quite a few, but we'd be here all night, so I'd rather the email. In the interest of <laughs> that, I was that we would email the WB right. said and come back right. later on. Would you like to, Councilman Dalton, do you have something you want to read in specifically? That, um... Well, I do. I have questions on the televising city council meeting over two years, 755,000. I'm certainly proponent for it. I agree with Councilman Bullock with, uh, don't know, with the use of National Guard Armory and then the, um, and, and question if we even need to own more property because it's a big portion of our. Our budget and, and the upkeep of property is um, seems to be a struggle that we have here in, in Rocky Mount. Um, fire station realignment, depot and park, a lot of things that I'm just not aware of. Um, judicial center improvements. I thought we've been working on some of those. Is it best? I've got a lot of questions. I, I really do. Um, and well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we? Why don't we do this first pass, we'll provide an email to the manager, allow the manager to respond to it. If we have a, a narrowed list from that point, then we can discuss that at the next city council meeting or the next budget meeting as appropriate. So, uh, um, this is my question. Yes, sir. Um, normally, we have a schedule. You know, then we prove that yeah. last, the last So, when is, when is the CIP scheduled for discussion? There's a public hearing, probably. Which one of the four meetings uh, we have to take on the CIP? Typically, would be typically once we have completed a review of the accounts directly, and then we'll probably, it'll probably be the third, be the second or third meeting, second or third work session meeting. So we have time to discuss it without questions. Sure. And I know normally this is not normal time. <laughs> <laughs> we would have been, we would have had an introduction to this at the retreat. Right. Right. And everything, and sort of feel the first shots off the bat. And I'm just trying to filter out, get back right. to the issues that may be. Uh, my guess is you can probably answer 80 percent of these, and just whatever. And then we're down to 20 percent we want to talk about. And I'm just trying to get to that level for so, everybody's benefit. So, so you want to receive this within the next two weeks? I would say within within this week, actually. Okay. Um, 
close the business file on Friday. Is that yes? Fair enough. All right. Well, well, yes, sir. Uh, I do. Councilman Walker. Uh, everybody knows that, that um, Councilman Walker and myself and the mayor are new to this whole process, but I, I guess, Madam Manager, what I would like to see, um, if possible, is certainly send you the questions. And I guess everybody can probably, some of us are going to have the same questions, others are going to have different ones. But if we have a response prior to, to our meeting, that way we can, it, it's, yeah. some, some people have to digest some stuff prior to a meeting, and I would appreciate that, if that's possible. Well, that's why we would like to have your questions by the end of this week, because that, that helps us to prepare the responses. Um, as you know, um, I will share those questions and the responses to the full council. Right. So I agree. I agree. Uh, we, will, um, we will definitely be able to see what the common uh, concerns might be. And some of those items are based upon the, uh, I guess, uh, the priority of the council uh, when it comes to CIP and, and the budget. So uh, we do have a chance to uh, work through that as well. Yes. So some things are uh, priorities and some things may not be priorities to some. Thank you. And that's part of the verification, I believe. Well. That's, that's correct. Well, again, I think as um, Councilman Blackwell pointed out, we never had the opportunity for the retreat. Correct. Yes. And as you recall, those of you who have been part of the retreat, we spent a, a good part of the day talking about the capital budget. And from that, this document would have been prepared. So absent that, we could only rely on what we believe is out there, which is why you see things like televising the city council um, chamber. Okay. And one of those things it would be an example. We never really talked about that, but there was a lot of discussion about that. So um, we are um, um, proceeding in, in a way that we haven't before because we haven't had the opportunity for retreats. So for clarity, what we're going to do is we're going to acknowledge receipt of the CIP. If you have a question about the uh, CIP, whether that be greater detail, whether you would like to see it removed, or whether you'd like to see a different prioritization on it, uh, please indicate that to Madam Manager before close of business uh, this week, and then she will be able to provide for us, on all her staff, uh, answers to our questions that she will provide to the full council, and then from there we can add that to discussion in our various budget meetings. So, Mr. Mayor, would you entertain a motion to accept this information? I would delight in one. Second. Second. Is there any additional discussion that needs to be made? Yeah. Being not all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Uh, item 14 are appointments for various committees. I do have one that has been presented to me for the Animal Care and Control Advisory Board, and that is for a Fred Trey Wright III, and he is in Ward 5. Um, so, process here, I think I'll be looking for a, uh, a motion and second and approval. So moved. So moved by Councilman Joyner. Second. Second by uh, Councilman Daltridge. Is there a need for discussion? Being on all in favor of making Mr. Wright a member of the Animal Control and uh, Advisory Board, uh, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Great. Uh, are there any additional conversations or items or nominations uh, on item 14 that we need to entertain this morning? Well, Mr. Mayor, I, I guess we do take this opportunity to assume a lot of people watching this meeting on um, social media, but if you're an interested um, resident of Rocky Mount, Please contact uh, any of your council members. Uh, there, are, there are openings, and I think um, they're on the website, maybe on the clerk's portion of the website. So I would encourage anybody that's interested in getting involved in government to please do so. I think that's right. All right, now at item 15, we need to move to closed session. It's an attorney client privilege matter regarding um, some human resource issues, personnel issues. And attorney clients. So moved. 